Hello, welcome to Lessons of Vietnam. Uh, tonight's guest is a very special uh, guest. I've known him about 20 years now. I've uh, got a great story, so I know you want to uh, tell all your friends about it. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or whatever, give us a call at 919-518-9773 or go on to Skype and go to Computers 2K, as in Kilo, Voice, and ask your questions, make your comments, and so forth. I uh, just want to bring up a couple of things before we get started with our guest. Uh, this coming up uh, next Monday is uh, Memorial Day, and I, I, even to still, uh, a lot of people have a problem with Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Veterans Day is a day we recognize everybody who served. Memorial Day is a very special day. It's a day that we recognize all of those who gave the uh, ultimate price for their um, serving our country. Uh, didn't think about it at the time, but that's uh, very apropos with our guest tonight. But uh, I found something today that I thought was really good, and I want to read this to you, and then we'll start off with our guest. The American flag does not fly because the wind moves past it. The American flag flies from the last breath of each military member who has died serving it. So this Memorial Day, if you're out having a party, having a barbecue, out on a boat or whatever, at 3 o'clock, don't know where the time that came up with 3 o'clock, but that's the national time, to take a moment and think about all of those who gave everything for our country, and their families. It's not when a, when a veteran dies or a, a, basic, a soldier of any kind dies, it's not just that one person. It's the effect of the entire family uh, that carries on and on and so forth. And take a moment and, and remember why you have the freedom to go out and do the things that you're doing. Uh, Memorial Day, be sure and, and spend some time uh, the Marine Corps League will be doing a service at the uh, state capitol at the monument we call the uh, Bowling Trophy, but it's the War Memorial there. They're going to be doing their uh, thing at uh, 11 o'clock, and then at 12 o'clock, NCBI will be doing its monthly uh, special uh, reading of the names of the uh, 39 from North Carolina who are still missing. Now, I'm going to move over to our guest. Uh, our guest tonight is Barbara Abernathy. Uh, Barbara is a North Carolina native. I am. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, her story a little bit. But let me kind of go into a little bit with Barbara how we came about uh, meeting each other and so forth. Uh, several years ago, it's been right at 20 years now, Bob Matthews started a course at In Law High School, which is where this show came from, was the Lessons of Vietnam. Uh, what he did was that he uh, dedicated the uh, course to... Uh, two ladies whose sons were uh, lost in Vietnam, and it was in the paper. And, Barbara, I believe you read the paper and, 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 and called Bob and, and asked you to come to class. And Tell us a little bit about how all that came about. Well, I had um, Don, who was my fiancé, who was killed in Vietnam, his letters were missing, and I had just... Um, come back from going to my parents' house and um, finding the letters in the attic. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, was reading the NNO that Sunday afternoon, and there was an article about lessons in Vietnam about it and about Bob. And I happened to be friends with the person who was on the school board, so I called her up and said, you read the article? And she said, yes. And I said, well, I want to take that class. Make it happen for me. And she said, well, before I try to exercise any authority, let me ask if you'll just call Mr. Matthews and ask him if you can sit in on his class. And so I did. I called Bob and I said, read, your art, read the article. I'm really interested in the class and I'd like to come. And Bob being Bob said, well, we would love to have you for, to come for one session, come two sessions if you'd like. And I said, well, I don't think you understand. I want to come to every single session. And he said, what? And I said, yeah. It's about time I learned about Vietnam. And so I was um, a lot older than the kids in the class, but in my brain and in my emotions, I was about four years older than a lot of those kids in that class. And so 
together we learned about Vietnam. Yeah. Let's now that uh, we've kind of got an introduction of how we uh, all came about. Uh, you grew up now. Where do you? Where, you're from uh, Lumberton. I am. Okay, and uh, you had a boyfriend that you grew up with school with. Yes, Don and I. Don moved to Lumberton uh, when we were about ten years old. He was just a little bit older than I am, and we went through high school together. And we were best buddies, best friends. I never dated him, but he was always in my life. Um, he was the only person my parents would allow to just come into the house and find me no matter where I was. My parents adored him. Everyone adored him. But he dated my friends, and he looked out for me when I was dating his friends. And so we went off to college, to the same college, and then he went to Vietnam. And it was, um, I got it, actually got engaged to another person that Don thought was such a fine guy, and I did too. And Don came home and said to me after I got engaged that if I married him, I would be very happy, but that he needed to tell me he could not be a part of my life after that. And it was a real shock. And it was at that time that I realized that the feelings I had for Don were not just friends, just friends' feelings. Mm -hmm. And so we were engaged when he left to go to Vietnam, and I wanted to get married before he left. But he said, no, you've always wanted that great big wedding. You're going to be through with school when I get home. You know, you have the wedding planned, and we'll get married as soon as I get home. And it just didn't happen that way. Now, what year did he go to Vietnam? He went to Vietnam in the fall of 1968. 1968 fall. And okay. I was a senior in college. Okay. And I was the only person that I knew who had a fiancé or a boyfriend or anything in Vietnam. It was really strange to... Was there a lot of uh, uh, against the war and protesting going on in school? Mm-hmm. Now, what yeah. school did you go to? I went to NC State. Oh, okay. So, uh -huh. yeah, I've, heard of, I've heard of that place. Yeah, there, was, there were a lot of people who were very much against the war. And I was kind of against the war. I didn't want him to go. I begged him to go, not to go. And um, he could have, the Army had offered him another choice to do something else. But he's, in his mind, he was going to end up in Vietnam no matter what. And he said, I'm just going to go ahead and go now and get it over with. And so he, he went. What was his job in Vietnam? Uh, he was a platoon leader. Okay, so he was an officer. Um, he was actually promoted while he while he got to Viet after he got to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. What they offered him was to go to officer school. Okay, officer school. And he refused to go because he said he wasn't going to make the army a career, and he did not want to be an officer. That he just wanted to be with the regular guys, and yeah. that was done. He was. Even though he was a leader in our community and he was a leader in our school, in our high school, and he went to state on an athletic scholarship, um, he never considered himself someone who had to be recognized. He just wanted to be a part of everything and to contribute as much as he could and not to be a leader. But what usually happened with Don was he always ended up the natural leader. Mm -hmm. of a group and so I could understand that he didn't want to to go to officer school but yes very yeah. well I, I, I backed out myself um how long was he in in Vietnam before he lost his life mm, three months three months mm -hmm. okay that's pretty short pretty uh, short time how did how did you find out about it that's that uh, what had happened um, I had come home from the library. I lived off campus at that time. And my doorbell rang, and I thought it was the person who had picked me up at the library and take, to take me back to my apartment. Coming back, and I went running down the steps because I thought, oh, I guess I left some books in the car, and opened the door, and there stood my mother and my father and my brother. And no one had to say anything. I just knew. Mm -hmm. And he had actually been missing for two days before I found out. 
and no one would come and tell me or call me because they didn't they didn't want to tell me they didn't want me to know until they had some kind of definite information and so it was in the local newspapers it was on the local news unlike most of the things that happened to the guys who came back from Vietnam um, when it happened to Don it was news and everyone was very very upset and concerned about it but I lived in my little tower in Raleigh <laughs> as long as I listened to the news at night and we had a TV at my apartment and I would watch the 6.30 news, and it was only 15 minutes at that time. And if Walter Cronkite or Dan Rather said nobody got killed in Vietnam that day, I knew I was good for a couple more days. Um, and he got killed. He was just missing, and then they, they found his body. They did, they did find him. Oh, yeah. He came okay. back in one piece, and he had been shot three times. And the guys... Um, I got letters from the guys that were under him and that were, that were with him, and some of them came to see me when they, when, when they came back. Um, and they said what happened was that they had been on the ground and they got, back, they got back into three different helicopters and they were doing countings, and Don realized that there was somebody that wasn't there, and his helicopter went back, and he got off the helicopter with two other guys to go get that, find that person when he got killed. And let's see, that would have been in, uh, in, in, in 68. Yeah, um, in December of 1968. And you always uh, had those, uh, the feelings for Don all this time, and uh, I guess it just really left a, a, a hole. Well, it just kind of, my life just kind of went to a, to a total stop. Um, I called my favorite college professor that night, told him what had happened and that I was going home. Um, I called the guy that I had gotten engaged to previously. Um, he was in Raleigh at the time, and uh, I had seen him and told him what had happened and, and that I was going home. Um, and then I went home, and there was a week before his body came back that I spent with his, his two sisters and my family. And all of our friends were in college, you know, or were out. So people just kind of trickled in from other places, and I would see people. Um, and the day of his funeral, um, the night before his funeral, they had visitation and everything, formal visitation and everything. And I just stood there and you would have thought you were at a football game or a basketball game because it was just massive amounts of people um, that were there. And the day that, um, the day of his funeral, they actually, they didn't formally close the schools, but they said any kid that wanted to, to leave school and go. And they did. Um, but... I don't remember it. Um, I still get emotional about this. That's no problem. The, the day of Don's funeral, um, I got in the car. I thought with Don's favorite cousin that it was his, his favorite, one of his other favorite cousins. And I don't remember the funeral. I don't remember graduating from college. I don't remember getting a job. Um, my life just kind of went blank. Um, and so there's a lot of my history after Don got, let, got killed that I only know from what people have told me and what I've been able to put together. Um, but they, it sounds like they did bring you, embrace you, embrace you. That, uh, I look, you sometimes hear stories, well, you weren't it's not his wife, you were just his fiance, and you got kind of left out. But it sounds like... Uh, uh, you were included so much oh, yeah. in, in, in the family. And yeah, I mean, with with everything that was going on in in Lumberton, I was totally, you know, in, you know, it was it was my life. Yeah. Um, and um, our parents had been friends. His mother had had died uh, two years before him, but I mean, everyone knew him, and uh, 
But And when I came back to college, um, I came back to my friends in college and a few of his. Um, but I didn't have anyone... I just didn't have that kind of support mm -hmm. that I that people talk about they didn't get. I didn't get it mm -hmm. when I came back to school. I had it at home, and I had it until the day of his funeral. But when I came back to college and for months after that, people knew that there was something wrong and there was something different about me, but nobody could figure out what it was. Um, they said I, I didn't talk about Don. It was like he didn't even exist, um, and that... If people tried to say something about him, you know, I, I would just divert and go to something else. Um, and that I tried to just put my life back in gear and keep on going. Mm -hmm. uh, what I didn't know was that um, I insisted on taking my exams, and I flunked every single one of them and got put on academic probation for my senior <laughs> last semester. And thanks, thanks to my professors, um, they got me through it, and I did graduate from college. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a miracle. <laughs> so years later, when uh, you saw the article about Bob, uh, and you joined the class, and uh, you became a very important part of the class, you uh, participated and, and helped on the trips to Washington, D.C., to the Wall. Yeah. And, uh, and when Bob took some teachers to back to Vietnam, you were one of the people who went with him. Yes. You know, that must uh, that was had to be hard to get on that airplane going to a country that all you knew about it was what happened to Don. It's um, it was hard, but from the from the moment that I opened the door and saw my parents and my brother standing there, I just had this sense if I could get to Vietnam, I could make it right. And, of course, I couldn't get to Vietnam because we Americans were not allowed to go. And so when they did open up to Americans to go under American passport, I was determined that I was going to go. And it was just, I was just so fortunate that Bob and, and the vets and everybody had come into my life at that time. Um, so there was, a, there was a group that went. It, there was a photojournalist. Mm -hmm. and a journalist, and three vets, and Bob and me, um, and the head of the history department for the North, yes, Esther, the Esther, for the North Carolina School Sweet System. Sweet lady. Um, and I believe we a, a, a reporter from, uh, from the uh, Cary News. Yeah, that was the journalist, Sherry oh, okay, Williamson, yeah. who Sherry is Williamson. one of my who dearest won, friends. Who won a uh, Emily uh, with did. an article about you. And, she, and, did. Uh, she did. She uh, did. Uh, and she begged me for weeks after we got back to let her write that story, and um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let her do it. And then finally, I, I did, and it was really, it really brought Sherry and me very, very close together. Mm -hmm. But no, I wasn't scared to go to Vietnam. I was, I really, I just, I wanted to go. I wanted to see where he died. I wanted to talk to the people. I wanted to see what I could find out. And all of his letters to me talked about the beauty of Vietnam. And about the, a lot of the letters were about the kids. Mm -hmm. And he thought the women were absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> um, he told a lot of funny stories about um, some of the Vietnamese women and that he met in various capacities um, and how not, the, not just their outward beauty, but their inward beauty, too. Mm -hmm. um, so his letters were very funny, but we really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, it sounds fact, like I, Bob. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, speaking, speaking of the devil, he's on, he's on the air. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Go ahead, Bob. Hey, Bill. How are you doing tonight? I'm uh, doing great. I would like to congratulate that superstar next to you, Barbara <laughs> Abernathy. Because, you know, Bill, you and I both know that the reason this course is so popular are people like her that dug deep and took care of the kids and showed them the way home. Uh, she rolled right into class and, and kind of uh, uh, got the ball and kept running with the trips to D.C. and, and, and looking after the, them and making sure everything was taken care of. But uh, I don't know what you'd have done without it. Well, I tell you, the first day she came to class, 
She said, I'm coming to class. I think she was coming one day. I was confused. She was coming every day. <laughs> and, and it was great because uh, she is such a wonderful person and dealt, dealt with such a horrific loss and turned it into a plus for Wake County Schools. Yeah. I well, mean, she said she, she kept coming to class, but wasn't because of, of the instructor, all the good information he was putting out. Was, it, was, it was the no, kids. I had nothing to do with it. And you, then you've had met, everything to do with yeah. it. <laughs> and then she met you guys and fell in love with the vets, and we fell in love with her. Yep. And I wanted to, on the air with you, of course, your, your show is doing great, and I wanted to congratulate Barbara because we would have been nowhere without her. So, Barbara, you'll always be there, and, right. we'll, and we'll be there for you. Well, that's kind of how I feel, too. She's going to always be one of, one of our members. So You better, leave, you better believe yep. it. You guys have a, a good show, and Barbara, congratulations, and thanks for sharing. Okay, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bill. Bob, while I got you on there, I want to ask I want to ask Barbara a question. When y'all went back, was it a local veterans group that went back, or was it a Bob Matthews group that went back, or was it NCBI oh, so group funny. that went back? You're, you're, you're so funny. Who went? I know one thing about What was the name of the group that when you went back? The Bridge Back. The Bridge hey, Back, okay. Hey, Bill. Yes. <laughs> Barbara had a cold beer on the Mekong. Uh-huh. <laughs> going, down, going down the Mekong? Having a cold beer. <laughs> okay, we did buddy. a lot of great things that trip to Vietnam. Uh, how was? How did she do on the uh, Montagnard uh, house? Oh, uh, she, she was great. Well, once I walked her to the bathroom and didn't watch. <laughs> what was, what no, was, was the, What was the was uh, a five she gallon bucket? Everything. No, it was a it was a little bamboo wall that you walked behind. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> you, you guys take care now. Thank you, Bob. Thank Bob, you, Bill. Thank you, Bob. Right. Bob was actually with me when I went to see where Don had died. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Y'all probably heard about Song, who was our, our overall tour leader. He still is. And um, he hand-selected a young guy who was probably about two or three years out of college. His name was Quan, uh, and he, he was our tour guide with, with Song for part of the time. But one day, Bob and Quan and I set off on our own and we had to stop about every 10 minutes, it seemed. But every time we got to a new jurisdiction, we'd have to stop and ask for permission to continue. And uh, Don was killed outside of um, a place called Coochie. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went and met the government officials there and the military officials there. And they told me if I had let them know I was coming, that they could perhaps have gone through their records, which they have a lot of detail in, they said, and actually taken me to the place where Don was killed. But since they didn't even know I was coming, they just gave me free reign to go anywhere I wanted to. And they told um, Quan some areas that we might want to, to go and look. Mm -hmm. But we just went, and uh, our car broke down. <laughs> uh, but people came out Somehow the word went that there was a Caucasian in the neighborhood, and there was she was also an American, and he was also an American. And it was the first time that they had seen not just a Caucasian, Caucasian but an American in, since the war. Since the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people just came out, and children were speaking English to us, trying to say, hello, hello, what's your name, what's your name, how old are you? Yeah, yeah. All sorts of good things. But it, it really was a great, great experience to be received by the local military who worked, because I was very much afraid of, the North, of northern Vietnam at that time. Mm -hmm. And so for someone from the north to treat me that way, it was just absolutely awesome. And that night when I, we got back to um, our hotel, Quan had written me a letter that he slid under my door sometime during that night. Um, and it was the kind of letter that Don would have written me uh, that essentially said, you know, this is tragic. A tragic thing has happened to both of us. To all of us, it wasn't just an American tragedy, but it was also a Vietnamese tragedy. Um, and the best we can do was just be kind to each other. Mm -hmm. 
And I still have that letter. And Quan became my Vietnamese brother. We still keep in touch with each other. And every time I go to Vietnam, we see each other. And he actually came to the United States several years ago and went, finished his master's degree in environmental studies um, at a college just outside of Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, Now, when you, you came back, uh, a different person because you had fallen in love with the with the Vietnamese people and, yeah. and the kids and so forth. Yeah. And uh, you then, didn't just come back. You uh you came back and got involved with Vietnam and Yeah. And, and been back many times. I have. Uh, um, you lived there for quite some time. For quite some time. I came back the night that um the night that we went to to see where Don got killed was the first night that I can ever remember that I cried. And I went through all the stages of grief that night. I remember calling my parents and crying with them on the phone. But the next day, we sat out, and um, I saw the beauty of Vietnam for the first time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just where the enemy lived. It was the, the beautiful place. So, um, and Song gave me my name going over the Havan Pass on the way yeah. to Way. Uh, which is, you, you're in the top of the mountains and you look down and you can see the ocean miles away yes. in front of you. And Song gave me the name Kim Huey because it meant the sky and the ocean. And he said he could just see my eyes change when I saw the beauty of that place. Mm -hmm. So we came back and the next year I went, I told every, my friends and my family that I was going to meet friends and they thought I was meeting American friends over there. And I went back, and Quan met me at the airport, and I went to see where he lived and his family lived, and I saw what tourists didn't see. And then I went to um, Pleiku, where another tour guide uh, that was part of our tour uh, picked us up. And I went in rice paddies and rode elephants and just did things that tourists didn't get to do again. And I got to see the real Vietnam for the first time. And I kept doing that, and I kept doing that. And finally, um, Quan said to me one day, why don't you come over here and get a job? And I said, I can't come over there and work. And he said, well, come over here and go to school. You keep trying to talk to people, and you can't speak Vietnamese. And so I said, well, can I do that? And he said, yep, but you got to go to school in the north. Got to learn proper Vietnamese. So I flew to Hanoi and went to the university and talked with them and um, made application, came back and quit this incredible job I had with Wake County government developing aging programs and moved to Vietnam all by myself. And I was just fortunate enough on the, the plane to have met someone who was also going to Hanoi. And through him, I met a person who became my landlord and who just his family became my family. Mm -hmm. um, but what really happened that was so neat was during the months that I was there, right after I got there, um, the chief executive officer for Ford Motor Company in Vietnam uh, came to, we had a party, and he brought this lovely Vietnamese girl who was the customs agent. She was a lady. And she and I just clicked. And the next night, I met her husband and the little baby. And they really became my Vietnamese family. And um, Now, where were they? Were they in Hanoi? They or? were in Hanoi, and he was just starting his own business. And uh, the day after he met me, he made his first major sale. So Vietnamese people were very superstitious, yes. so I was very much his good luck charm. And so he was anxious to stick with me, but I was in love with that little girl they had. And that little precious girl is now a sophomore at Meredith College. She was, her parents sent her to me to go to high school, and she went to St. Mary's School for Girls in Raleigh as a boarding student. And now, and now she's back in Vietnam, and I'm supposed to join her in June. And does so. she stay with you? Does she stay? Mm -hmm. She lives on, she has always lived on campus. She spends all of her holidays with me. Mm -hmm. And um, she's a member of our family. <coughs> right. Excuse me. So she's just an, an adorable. When did I move to Vietnam in 19, 
90, I want to say 97, but I'm not real sure. Somewhere in that range. Somewhere in that range. Um, but I, I came home during one of my last visits, and my dad was ill, and so I decided I should stay in the States, and so I've never finished a degree. I know I get the National University of Vietnam is still waiting for me to come over there and finish, <laughs> but I'll never do it. But I do go back a lot. I haven't been able to go back a lot in the last few years because of my mom's health. Um, but, you know, I was over there at least once a year for a long time. Now, Robert, going back to Vietnam is one thing, but going back to Hanoi, that's a, that's a, that's a totally different thing because uh, today there's still two Vietnams. Not in my eyes anymore, because uh, I, the people in North Vietnam are just as kind and generous as the people in South Vietnam. The people in South Vietnam, to me, seemed a little a little friendlier. I, I guess with us soldiers going back, it's a little different. Yeah. But to, to, uh, to us, the South Vietnamese people are just uh, out, just going out of their way to to be nice, and the people in and in the northern yeah. part were just a little more reserved, I guess. With they us. are they are more reserved. It's kind of like the difference between living in the South in the United States and living in the North in the United States. Mm -hmm. When we were young, you know, there's there's just a a cultural difference, and there's a cultural difference. Northern Vietnam was very very French, and uh, it had a lot of Chinese influence, whereas the South, you know, had a lot of. They're kind of like Miami people. <laughs> you know, they're really kind of neat, uh, but yeah. One of my best friends um, in Hanoi's parents were founding members of the Communist Party and um, had spent time in what we call the Hanoi Hilton, where the American soldiers stayed, mm -hmm. um, because the French actually built that prison to yes. house Vietnamese. Um, but she said to me one day, she said, you know, I never thought I'd have an American friend. And um, it was through a mutual friend that we met and became friends, and she eventually married an American and uh, spends part of her time in Arizona now. But uh, it was really interesting. But, you know, she had grown up thinking that uh, Americans were not to be trusted and were not to be liked. Yeah. And uh, she found it to be very much not the case. But, but their government, their, the Vietnamese people, the way I see it, are very much like us. Um, they want a good life. They want a good business. They want, they want their freedoms. The Lord, they just want the government to stay out of their business the same way we do. Yes, and uh, it's yeah, it's just like that. And um, it's not the communism. It's still communism, it's, but it's not the communism that you th uh, in, in other countries and, and no, so forth. It's so. Uh, they still don't. Ha they still got to watch what they say and, and so forth in, in public. But it's it's yeah. a different communism than I think it's uh, than what we have looked at as other other countries. Yeah. Uh, I think it's easier to go in business in Vietnam today than it is here. Probably in some areas, yes. Yeah. But I think of Vietnam as being probably about twenty to twenty five years behind us. Going back, I've seen every time I would go back, I would see a little bit less of Vietnam and more of the. European American influence mm -hmm. on Vietnam, and uh, they still don't have all the protections to do business that um, we Americans and we Europeans think that we have. Yeah. Um, but um, my goddaughter's father is very, very successful in Vietnam, uh, but he's he's also very much aware that he's not working in an American economy, mm -hmm. uh, and. Even with when Ford Ford Motor Company was in, in Vietnam, you know, Ford doesn't own that land that that factory is built on. In a hundred years, that that whole thing reverts back to Vietnam, and you start the process yeah. all over again. It's like they got a hundred year lease on it, and they could build whatever on it. Uh, so, but yeah, everybody wants to do a business in Vietnam. I'd love to have a Chick Fil A in <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> um, well, Colonel, or an American Colonel, hot dog. Colonel sandwich. Sanders is doing well. McDonald's is doing yes, well. Yes, which is uh, kind of sad because uh, the, the, you know, the Vietnamese people that can afford to go to those places, 
think they're wonderful, and I say, but that's not really where we want to eat in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, I, 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 but looking at the society there, there's a strong middle class that was not a president during, during the war. It's, uh, yes. uh, there's some people who are, are doing very well, uh, but the rice farmer hadn't changed a whole lot. No, the rice farmer has not changed a whole lot, except to lose his land for an interstate system or to lose his land for a factory to go up. Um, a, uh, Chung, uh, Chung's parents um, own an apartment in an apartment building in Hanoi that was pro mostly financed by the government giving farmers a certain amount of money. They gave them a, an apartment to live in and an apartment to rent to displace them taking their rice fields mm -hmm. because they didn't have any, they, don't, they weren't educated. They don't have an ability to just go out and make money. And I applaud the government for at least giving them something. And so they live in one of their apartments and they rent one of their apartments for enough for them to, to live. And, they, and Chung's mom says that some of them will tell, them, tell you that they like the life a lot better. It's more comfortable. It's more easy. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them really miss yes. being in the open air and the, being, the able to, being, the, out, being out outdoors there. Yeah. and everything. But, yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of sad. Uh, those folks work really hard now. I, the last time I was there, I did see uh, evident it was some large uh, commercial rice farming uh, that was actually had a machine out there rather than, uh, but you could tell that was a large combine rather than uh, the individual uh, rice farmer. And so oh, forth. yeah. Um, and uh, Chung's parents own a research labs, and they've done a lot of research to, to try, try to grow the potatoes in Vietnam that Kentucky Fried Chicken wants and McDonald wants, mm -hmm. so they don't have to be imported. Um, but they haven't been successful to grow them yet to the quality because they don't have the American fertilizers and stuff yeah. to do it with. Well, each time you go back, uh, you, you, it's, it's amazing how much the country has changed each time. And Every time I go back, it's like, where was my favorite place to eat pho? It's gone. And what's there now is is an, a high rise, yeah. and you know it's and you go to your favorite little place in the countryside and it's not there anymore. And I think I'll have to quit going when I go to Hoi An and I cannot go out on the beach, and them come and ask me what kind of seafood I want and cook the seafood on the beach for you to sit there, and just enjoy being on the beach and eating those delicious crabs. <laughs> You know, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen the way other businesses are coming into Vietnam and building massive resorts that the typical Vietnamese person can never afford to go to. Uh, you know, I, the last time I was there, I actually went into the Rex Hotel, asked them where the Rex Hotel was. It had changed that much. Yeah. Uh, did he, and once you get inside, well... When you get inside, it still doesn't look like the old Rex until you get into the old part. Mm -hmm. But I actually went inside, and can you tell me where the Rex, where the Rex uh, restaurant and bar is? And, and he showed me where it was. But I was in the Rex Hotel. It's it's amazing yeah. the um, the growth and the money that's going in there. Uh, when we first went back, the infrastructure was way behind, but they're paving a lot of roads now uh, over there and so forth. So uh, it's yeah the. To, to a certain extent, it's becoming more and more Western uh, when you go over there. It's, it it's losing a lot of the, some of the flair, the big cities uh, yeah. of uh, the Vietnamese people and and so forth. But uh, yeah, and it, it's it's kind of sad because you see what the same thing is beginning to happen to their kids in school that have happened to our kids in school, where the cell phone is what they want, the internet is what they want. Hanging out with their friends is what they want, mm -hmm. and instead of trying to to learn stuff, they had rather just just be on the streets, and it's really it's really sad. It's almost like English is the first language. Well, uh, English is a required uh, field of study in yeah. Vietnam now. Yeah. Uh, when I first went there, all the kids could speak Russian because you had to study Russian in school, and even in the university. 
there were no uh, formal English classes in some of them. And the kids would study English uh, in the South on their own at nighttime. Um, now, Chung's mom, she majored in English in college, but she was taught English not by an English-speaking person, but by Vietnamese who had learned it and everything. And um, she can write, read and write extremely well, but sometimes she still speaks her English with a broken Vietnamese accent. So it's, it's really strange and funny. So. Well, you mentioned a song while ago, The Guide. Uh, that's how he got out of the uh, re-education camps, is they sent him to Hanoi to teach English yeah. in Hanoi. And uh, I, the people I, the people I uh, encounter over there who speak English speak better than I do, which is not that hard. Yeah. Um, so, but it's, uh, it's amazing uh, how many people... It's amazing when you go to a country like that, even if they don't speak English, it's not a hard it's not hard to communicate and get across what you want. It's No, it's not. And it, you know, that's really what's interesting. Um, because when I first went to Vietnam I could speak French and that's how I got myself around. Mm -hmm. But only the older people spoke French. Um, so but you could, it's amazing what you can communicate to people without speaking a a word of their native language. Yeah. You're just have an innate ability to do it. Now, when you were living in Hanoi and they found out you're American, uh, was the uh, any difference where they treated you? or? I used to tell my friends in the U.S. that nothing was going to happen to me when I was in Vietnam, that they were not going to allow something to happen to an American citizen. Yeah. And I really felt that way. I felt safer in Vietnam than I have felt in the United States at times. There was never a time that I, that I, that I was afraid. Mm -hmm. um, one time I was at, uh, at home by myself, and uh, my, there was a doorbell rang, and I was on the second level, and I could look down, and I saw a police officer. And I didn't answer the door, and he kept ringing the door, and finally I opened the, the window, and I said in my perfect Vietnamese, I'm sorry, but no one's home to talk with you. Can you come back later? I don't speak Vietnamese. <laughs> and there I was saying it all in Vietnamese. But what he was doing was going around it. And now that I would thought, what are the police doing at my house? Are they here for me? Uh, but they were actually going around knocking on people's door to remind people that they had an election coming up and that they should vote. <laughs> but it was really funny that stupid me told him in Vietnamese that I couldn't speak Vietnamese. He'd have to come back later. <laughs> so, but no. Um, now, I didn't go out at nighttime or anything, but I had this friend who worked for the BBC, and um, she came over one night and wanted to know if she could borrow my bike. She had to go back to her office. And I said, sure. And so the next day, she hadn't brought my bike back, and I went over to her house, and she was still asleep. And she had been riding the streets of Hanoi at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning on my bicycle. And she, I said, weren't you scared? And she said, no, not at all. So, But I don't think it's that way now. No, I think if you go now, it would be a lot more dangerous because they, they have got so that, you know, they have, their economies improve. People stay out later. It's just it's a, just a different world over there now, the same way it is here. You don't walk the streets of Raleigh at three o'clock in the morning. Not downtown. Not down. Yeah. 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 Uh, the traffic, even the traffic slows down a little bit. Not a whole lot, but oh, it does slow down. Yeah. Uh, the, the traffic. If you've ever driven, think you've driven in traffic, go to Saigon and see the traffic there, and you realize you'll never complain again about traffic in D.C. or anywhere else. Uh, it is a wild, crazy place. Uh, uh, there, everybody goes everywhere in different directions, and uh, they just kind of blow the horn and, and keep going. But there's order to that madness. There really is. The, you know, people used to tell me, just start walking across the street or just on your bicycle, keep riding, and people will make room for you. And I found that to be true. Yeah. If you were just... If you stated your intent by your actions, that it just happened, and that's the way 
people were. But I had a motorbike in Vietnam, and I went to school at Johnston Tech and took lessons before I moved over there. And uh, my landlord went and got me a motorbike, and I thought I could do it in the streets of Hanoi. But when they're lined up 20 across and 150 behind you and the light turns green and they all start going and you're sitting there saying, I've got to take my foot off the ground. I quickly said to my landlord, would you go buy me a bicycle? <laughs> and my friends would take my motorbike out of Hanoi and I could do the countrysides. Mm -hmm. But I never was able to, to just ride a motorbike. In, or a little, It was a scooter, not a motorcycle. It was a scooter. In the streets of Hanoi. Well, you know, Barbara, here uh, you ride along. If someone happens, to, if you happen to turn on a turn signal, uh, I don't think anybody around here uses turn signals, but the guy in the other lane is going to try to get up there and cut you off. Uh, you can pull yeah, over. Yeah. And, in, and in Vietnam, they just kind of weave in and out of each other. It's like. Yeah, they just kind uh, of do it. Uh, so. it's, ama it's amazing there. Um, uh, the, mind, the mindset uh, is just, you know, I'm, I'm going and. Uh, yeah, I'm going to continue my spot, and you're welcome to right beside me. They ride right on top of each other. It's yeah. And there used to be a hierarchy in Vietnam where the person walking that had the greatest potential of getting hit got the greatest uh, uh, service from people. And then it was the bicycle, and then it was the motorbike and a car. And if they hit you, it went down in terms of who had to pay. You hit a pedestrian and anything you paid and everything but now there's so many cars over there that sure. they seem to forget about that poor person that's walking or on a bicycle now, yeah. the same way we do in the United States. And uh, they don't have bicycle lanes over there. It's one lane. And some of the roads, is a bicycle cannot get on it, and a person walking cannot get on it. And I, for their safety, I think that's a, a good idea. But I'm afraid that more and more the person that cannot afford to have anything other than a bicycle is getting left behind in Vietnam. No sidewalks? Yeah, they have sidewalks, but you can't ride your bicycle and stuff on And the sidewalks are just as shrouded as the streets. Yeah. So it's hard to ride on the sidewalks. And, you know, the, the lines on the street doesn't mean anything. You kind of go in and out and so forth. Mm -hmm. and. It's amazing how they weave in and out and get so close to a bus or whatever, and they'll pull right out in front of a bus, and he might blow his horn, but he's going to slow down and let them go ahead. Yeah, it's, they're going to go ahead. It's, it's a, it's a, it is a really in adventure just to sit there and, and watch the traffic and go, God, how do they do that without getting killed? Of course, they do have, I think Song said the last time I talked to him, uh, well, he lives in Da Nang, it was like 35,000 uh wrecks that month in Da Nang and Long. So, oh, yeah. Uh, they do They do have a lot of uh, bumps and grinds and so forth, but nobody seems to uh, get too upset about it and so forth. So Yeah. I don't know what their laws and policies are now in terms of hitting someone, but when I was living in Vietnam, um, I did know a family where the husband hit someone on a bicycle and the family couldn't afford to pay all the doctor bills plus compensate the person who was hit financially, and he went to prison for several years because he couldn't they could, he couldn't afford to to pay him. Mm. Uh, it wasn't a matter of him guilty whether he was guilty or not. It was just like he had the more powerful mode of transportation and hit someone, whether they walked in front of him or what. He hit him, and so he had to pay for it. He spent time in prison for it. So it's kind of interesting. Our laws are not like that here. Uh, so. Now you are, uh, you've got uh, everything lined up to go back in of June, to, uh, back to Vietnam. Hopefully. Uh, where are you going this time? Um, well, I'm going to fly into Hanoi, and uh, then with uh, my goddaughter's parents, uh, we're going to go to some of my favorite places in Vietnam that my goddaughter hasn't seen yet because she's been over in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and she has a younger brother and sister and they have tr they travel with their parents throughout Vietnam now but when Chung was growing up her parents were working all the time so she didn't, she's never been to some of the places in Vietnam that, I, that she wants to see that I wanted to see she's actually seen more of the United States than she has of Vietnam. Now, have you been to Halong Bay? Oh yeah 
I love Highline Bay. I, I love anybody who doesn't love Highline <laughs> yeah, Bay. So yeah. it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful place. Now, my favorite place is Hoi An. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, I just love Hoi An. It's, Hoi An is the one of the, probably the oldest city in uh, in Vietnam, yeah. and it's kind of a carnival atmosphere. Uh, but that's where you can get things made out of silk. Uh, so the uh, stores all open up to the uh, uh, to the road. Uh, in fact, uh, the last time we were there, one of the ladies that was with us happened to stand up out in front of a moped, and uh, it was uh, uh, she was very lucky. But they were, uh, I mean, before she hit the ground, the Vietnamese vendors there were helping her up, and it's just amazing how many people come along and try to. Uh, Helper and so forth, and uh, but Hoi An, Hoi An, you can spend several days there, yeah. uh, just looking just around. The problem with here. Hoi An, if it rains hard, uh, it may be ten feet of water downtown, but uh, uh, but the buildings there are, are beautiful. They're and beautiful. Some They're great restaurants in, in Hoi An. Yeah. Uh, right in the middle of town is an old French fort, and uh, but you can go in there and get measured that morning for a uh, a silk outfit, and by that afternoon they'll be delivering it to you. Uh, hand uh, custom made them um, silk. They show you how to make the worms mm -hmm. and how the worms and everything. Uh, you know, uh, Hoi An is is a, is a great town. Yeah, it is. And I, I'm, you know, most of the time that I'm back, I spend with friends that I made in Vietnam that I that I keep in touch with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there'll be a lot of just everyday living kind of stuff, and going to people's houses for dinner and having people over. Because my landlord usually has, has me an apartment when I go back, so I don't stay in a hotel. And having people over for dinner and just living a normal life. You know, I, yeah, I'll be there for two or three months when I, when I go. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. do. I mean, I've talked to a lot of American soldiers who say they never want to go back. Yeah. And I understand it. But... You know, if they could just see Vietnam through the eyes that I see Vietnam, they would see what a beautiful place it is. And they would see that the citizens of Vietnam are no different from the citizens of the United States. They are such a generous, loving people. And their war, they don't call it the uh, Vietnamese War. They kind of call it their Civil War. And it's kind of like our Civil War. You know, there were people in the North who had families in the South the same way we did, who lost families, and uh, they had the same kind of tragedies that we had in the United States. Um, and I think we were probably better equipped to deal with our tragedies than they were because we came home. But I asked one of my friends one day why they loved Americans so much, and we were all sitting around in a group, and... Um, they said, what's there not to love? They said, the Chinese came and we kicked them out. The French came and we kicked them out. The China came and we kicked them out again. They said, when America came, they brought, especially to the South, they brought new technology, a new way of doing business. They brought everything. And when, the, when Americans left, they didn't take anything. When Russia came in, they took everything. America didn't take everything. They left everything. Yeah, they and hate, so what they hate was there? The Russians right now. Yeah. So what is there about America not not to like? America gave us so much. And even the people in the north, you know, will say, you know, the south benefited so much from the Americans being there. Uh, and we're trying to catch up because even during the time that I could live when I lived there, you could tell that the North was still so much poorer than the South. Uh, you went to the South, and you could get out of anything you wanted. Yeah, the you know, we could definitely going yeah, on in the South. It's just getting to the North. And, uh, it's, but it's an amazing country, and the people, they just have a gentle soul about them. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I just hope they don't lose it with all the progress and all the... Yeah, well, they're, still, they're still scared to death of China. Uh, because China is trying to grow and, and so forth. And, of course, it's not the China Sea yeah. uh, there, even though that's what everybody else calls it. It's, yeah. I forgot exactly what, what, what they work for, but it's not you don't, you don't call it the China Sea there. No, you don't. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, do you go back to Cochise? 
I haven't been back. It's my intent to go back uh, with all the information that I can gather uh, and actually try to go to, to the area where Don died. Uh, but at this stage, it really doesn't matter whether I go or not because it was it was a totality of my experience in Vietnam. Um, and, you know, his, I've, I've made sense of his letters when he wrote about places I didn't know. And I, I spent just years trying to find out what this place called the Hobo Woods were, Hobo Woods, whatever. And uh, only to find out, I asked someone, and they said I was in the middle of it. You know, where he said that you couldn't see the tree in front of you because of the tree that you were, you know, it was so thick you just could not see to get anywhere. And uh, they were doing search and rescue in that area. And, um, yeah, but I've not gone through those tunnels that you crawl through. Yeah. I'm never going to do that. Uh, uh, but no, listen, they, uh, if you got any claustrophobic at all, you don't want to go. Yeah. What does uh, Donald's uh, uh, family think about you going over there and staying? They think you um, Well, I, I, la I learned years later that um, Don's family that I was extremely close to uh, went through a lot of the same kind of things that I did. And uh, his, so his youngest, his, his, um, his middle sister um, died several years ago. And I made contact with the youngest sister, and she's very much a part of my life now. Uh, she lives in Florida, and she would love to go to Vietnam sometime. Um, but um, her last visit to Raleigh after her sister died she brought me Don's um, letter jacket. She had found it in her sister's possess in you know, her stuff and brought it to me. And uh, with the understanding that when I was willing to give it up, um, that the Lumberton High School get that to go in their trophy case because mm -hmm. there's a big, one of the best awards you can get in that high school is named after Don. Uh, and uh, to go in the trophy case for him and then... Um, I saw her just a few weeks ago, and she, the first thing she said to me was, well, I found Don's um, football jersey. And she didn't tell me I'm bringing it to you. I think she's going to keep it for a while, but I hope I get it at some point to keep it for a little while before it goes um, back to Lumberton High School. But he's, you know, it's a shame that all the guys aren't remembered. Um, I, when I see the vets sometimes, they tell me they have these special ceremonies and stuff. And that it's not surprising for someone to walk up and want to know if anyone ever heard of Don McKenzie. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Do you ever, or did you ever look at a Vietnamese over there and say, you, and felt, you son of a, you took my love away from me? No. I never did. Never. And I think it had to do with the reception that I got when we traveled to the area where Don got killed. The, the compassion and the empathy that the um, military officers that I met and the government officials there um, was so kind. And it was like they understood while I was there. And they understood my my loss, and they wish they could have done more to help me. What about his family? Um, his his family, um, I understand that his dad was very, very um, upset um, that I just closed the door and walked away from Lomberton, from his family, from, from everybody. Um, my parents stayed still stayed in con contact with them and everything. But, you know, I'm just lucky that Don I mean, Junga's sister's in my life you're now. You're in contact with his sister. Yeah. Does she feel that, does she hate the Vietnamese because no. they took him? No, away? she doesn't. Nice. Her greatest, her greatest regret is that she was about 10 years old when Don died. And she doesn't have that many memories and, uh, you know, she picks my brain for memories when, when we get, and like I have sent her, gradually I've sent her some of the letters that Don wrote about his mother, not, not letters from Vietnam, but 
from the time he went into the military because he was drafted. He wrote about his mom. I sent her that. I wrote, I sent her select things, but at some time she'll get all the letters. But she's, she's gradually getting to know her brother, her, the, right. which is kind Through of. Through you, which is a positive thing. Yeah. yeah, well, she already knew that it was going to all be positive because she's, I don't think she's ever heard a bad thing about him from anyone in Lumberton. And, um, but, but to, to see him through my eyes, mm -hmm. the intimate way that she hasn't been exposed to, I think is a, is a gift that we can give each other. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very special that you have gone over and, and continued legacy for Don in Vietnam and, 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 and embraced the people over there and, and, and shown that we're all, we're all people, and they lost people the same way as we did. It's hard to look back and say, yeah. you did this because they they have people who were in, in, in the same boat that uh, and so forth. It's very very special you've been able to go back and embrace the people and the culture and so forth and, and, and continue going back because it is a beautiful country, and a lot of, lot of ex-soldiers have gone back uh, to live yeah. uh, and so forth. So... Uh, those of you uh, who say uh, you never go back, uh, I think if you go back one time that you would uh, probably want to go back again. Huh? Well, I remember um, I was real young, uh, and I spent Thanksgiving in Germany, and I was in Frankfurt, Germany, and went into a restaurant and sat down to eat and thinking, I wonder how many Nazis are sitting around me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you ask that question, I experienced that in um and now my niece lives in Germany, and it's a gorgeous place. And the German people are just incredibly nice. And she's married to a German guy. <laughs> and uh, the world just keeps on going and healing. And, um, you, know, I'm, you know, some people have asked me when they found out Obama was going to, to, to Europe and then when Clinton went, Vietnam just loves Bill Clinton, and they have fallen in love with Obama, too. I have not received that first negative thing except they said he was going to stay at this hotel and he we wasn't and he, we found out he was going to be at that one and he wasn't and I texted him back I said he probably stayed at the at the ambassador's house. <laughs> and and, yeah, yeah, they do that kind of stuff. But you know, they said that the reception that Obama got in Vietnam was was very very warm and that it was extremely covered on their news. Yeah, we got a, we got an email from Song we're just raving how, how the Vietnamese people uh, stood along the streets and uh, uh, in the rain and everything else waiting for him to come yeah. by and yeah. uh, just, just a chance to see the car. Yeah. And, uh, but I was living in Vietnam during the Clinton um, impeachment hearings and it was really strange the diff talking to the Vietnamese uh, my friends who were saying, what's the big deal? Our government <laughs> officials have affairs all the time. And Europe was saying the same thing, and I'm sitting there watching it. I would go to, go to school, come home, go to bed, so I could watch it on CNN all night long. And I was saying, who cares what he did? He didn't have to lie about it. That was my only issue, that he lied about it. Why didn't you just say it's none of your business? And everybody would have, it might have even blown over. But, you know, Vietnam was just saying... <laughs> We just don't understand you Americans getting so upset about it. <laughs> you know, and I said, but he lied about it. <laughs> they said, people lie all the time in Vietnam. <laughs> it's okay. Well, Robert, we run out, we're running out of time, okay. so I just want to tell you how much I uh, appreciate you coming on, uh, especially Memorial Day. Uh, I had not con put the two together, but uh, to show that uh, we can we can, we can uh, forgive uh, and go on with our life, not never forget, but uh, forgive and, and go on. There's yeah. there's always a, a good thing out there, and I think it's fantastic that you have been able to go back and, and not only what you did here with the classes and so forth with Bob, but what you have uh, gone to Vietnam and shown the Vietnamese people, uh, especially in the uh, northern part of the Vietnam, that uh, we're people just like they are and, and really how you've are. been embraced by them and you've embraced, embraced them and... Uh, I think it's fantastic, and uh, uh, hope you hope things work out uh, so that you can go back. Oh. Uh, so your mother's still. Yeah, I'm not, um, I've got some dental issues that I've got to take care of before I go. I started uh, dental surgery, and it's got to be finished. 
And to me, that takes priority because I can go in any time. I just want I just wanted to be there when my goddaughter was there. Mm-hmm. But she knows that she may have to come back and get herself back to Meredith by herself. And she can do that. She got her driver's license two days before she left. So uh, she's getting real excited to, to get back because there's, you know, she knows that she's got a car waiting for her and everything. She's getting my little yellow convertible. <laughs> so, well, I'd like to try happy. to get uh, get the information for the young lady that we're working with on a scholarship yeah. all day. Maybe you can stop by and see her because she is uh, she's really a sweet young lady and has really even after she left the orphan, she still goes back with her college friends and and helps out the kids and yeah. so forth. I'd like for her to get a chance to meet them and uh, uh, some other friends we have over there. But uh, thank you very much for coming yeah, in thank and. You. Uh, I'm glad it's you having that dental surgery instead of me. <laughs> I am. Oh, uh, it's not but, something uh, I expected to do. <laughs> uh, but uh, I hope everything works out so you can go back and uh, uh, while you while you're over there, uh, have a good hot bowl of pho for me. And, uh, and, my, I just can't wait to put my mouth on some cha ka. You know what cha ka is? Uh-uh. It's 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 a northern dish, but it's it's a fish dish, and it is so incredibly good. And there's nowhere in the United States that you can get it. That's because it's a special kind of fish, and they grow it. It's oh, it's just wonderful. So, well, I know that I still remember the fish that they it was standing straight up when they served it. Yes. Uh, and the gills and everything on it. That's uh, if you get by that fish, look how you're still swimming. It's it's good. Oh, it's so and, good. Uh, so. Uh, there's some great food. They do have some great food over there. Yeah. And, a lot, and different national. It's not different nationality, but different regions have different uh, dishes, just like mm-hmm. just like here. They so do. forth. But yep. uh, thank you very much. And exactly. the next show we have will be uh, the couple who wrote uh, "Tears of a Warrior." Uh, they will be uh, speaking through uh, Skype. Uh, be sure and tune in for that. It's a if you have if you know someone who is suffering from post traumatic stress. Or you know someone whose uh, family is uh, living with someone with post-traumatic stress. It's a great show for them. Uh, this couple is, um, she's a psychologist. He was a young second lieutenant uh, his first week in Vietnam. He's in a barracks with uh, three other second lieutenants. He gets mortared, and he's the only one that survives. And he came home with post-traumatic stress, and they've worked through it uh, quite a bit. And he has sat down and agonized and put together his story and so forth in the book. It's the Seahorns. And the book is so good that the military order, the Purple Heart, has bought uh, in bulk and vet centers and uh, places like that. You can get the book for free. If you like the book, uh, check it on Amazon or watch tune into the show. It's a fantastic book. Uh, somebody took mine away from me the other day because they wanted it and I had to get some more and uh, they already gone too so be sure and tune in for the show and Memorial Day Monday take time to remember why you're out of school or off work or whatever and thank you for tuning in good night You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brook, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Current Affairs with Omnon Nissan, And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.